Hi, I'm Butch Delaney, and I'd like to welcome you to the series Reconciling Science in the Bible. This is the second of five lessons from the field of philosophy, and all of these lessons deal with proofs of the existence of God. Tonight's discussion will be all about using an anthropological argument to determine whether God exists. We will look at several arguments for the existence of God in lessons four through seven. Last week's lesson was one from ontology, or the study of being. Anselm, a bishop of Canterbury, reasoned that there must be a God based on the argument that said, if God is the ultimate good in the world, then he must necessarily exist in reality. He cannot simply exist in our minds. So if you can imagine a perfect God, then he must exist because an ultimate being that exists only in one's mind is not as great as one that also exists in reality. Tonight's lesson is an anthropological argument. Anthro in science means man. So can we look at man and infer there must be a God? Think of major religions in various countries. I've listed five of them here. What do all of these seem to have in common regarding God? A belief in a God who looks something like a man. Man has shaped God into a man-like being. Think back on every image of God you've ever seen. These are just an artist's impression. What does he look like? A man, often seated on a throne, with light around him, possibly angels. No one knows what God looks like, but we often envision him as a male. This is a rather anthropomorphic representation. Anthro is the Greek word for man. Morphic implies the shape of the body. God has a man's body in the minds of most or perhaps a shadowy figure of pure light in the shape of a man. We'll come back to that thought in a little bit. Here's an interesting question. Is there any true need that exists in, our, in, in man that our environment does not provide? How would we feel if there were a true need of ours that the universe could not provide? All humans have these three things in common. We have a body, a physical shape and form. We have a soul. We are aware, we're conscious, and we're rational beings. And we have a spirit. We desire to be free, to love and be loved, and to be moral and rational. If we all have needs that the universe could not provide for us, we would feel as bad as the man in this picture, who unfortunately is in severe need of a hug right now. Have you ever thought that everything we hold dear to us, rationality, sexual desire, to love and be loved, to be moral, none of these qualities exist in nature. Many of them do not exist in the animal kingdom except for man, Everything we need is utterly out of place in our universe. How could man have been created out of such an environment? Let's use a very local example. On a warm and muggy Sunday in 2011, a Category 5 tornado swept over Joplin, Missouri. It came in from the southeast Kansas. It was massive. It was devastating. 158 people lost their lives and over a thousand were injured. There was a tremendous wind damage and damage from rain and flooding. It was the deadliest tornado since 1950 and the seventh overall for tornadoes. As you can see here, the path it took went through the residential areas and headed straight down toward the downtown business areas. After the storm, the tornado coast cost close to 4 million in damages, 160 lives were lost, and well over 1,000 injuries. 
<clears throat> By the way, there are three people in this image, all very close to one another. I've given you the location of two. Can you see the third? I'll give you a few minutes to look. If you look closely, you can see a baby in a baby carrier right near the roof line of the white car in the foreground. So here's the question. We desire rationality in our lives, but nature is an irrational entity. Nature has no ability to think or reason. So the question is, how did humans become rational? Most scientists believe that humans are the only species to exhibit rational decision-making. Some recent research suggests that possibly chimps, elephants, lions, and perhaps crows are capable of making a few simple rational decisions. So from where did our rationality come? Did we learn love from nature? Do the things in our natural environment show love or hate? toward us? Nature is completely indifferent to us. Whether we love it or hate it makes no difference. Most of us want to feel significance in our lives. We want to sense purposefulness in our lives. Some in the world are able to attain that, but many others fail at it. What is the goal of our lives? We all believe that we should be moral. We should do what's right and shun what society defines as amoral. We try not to maim, to injure or harm others. We try not to lie. We try to be fair, but there is no morality in nature. Things happen, both good and bad, regardless. We have a variety of natural disasters to contend with, floods and hurricanes and lightning, fires and snow and hail and high winds. This is what we get from nature. So where did our morality come from? Certainly not nature. Nature is very amoral. These kinds of things would not exist if God did not exist. Nature is none of these things. Without a God to guide us and shape us, there would be none of this in the world. No love, no morality, no selflessness, no purpose in life, no justice or mercy. None of us would have a feeling of personal significance. There would be no incentive, no desire of learning of any kind. All of this without a God. In essence, there would be no meaning to life. Now, I hated Blaise Pascal when I went got to graduate school. I had never used statistics in an undergraduate work, but in, God's, in grad school, I had to learn all about probability and Pascal's statistical methods for binomial distributions in the little scientific research that I did. His statistics of probability were difficult and hard for this cropper's, sharecropper's son, but uh, such is the case for anyone dealing with statistics of any kind. But the man was brilliant. He, uh, as a youngster, developed and produced a mechanical calculator, and he was a devout Catholic. So, this is Pascal's statement about man and nature. I'll let you read it. Pascal said, there is an infinite abyss in all of us that only can be filled with an infinite and immutable object. Of course, that's God. 
Later, C.S. Lewis developed an anthropological argument for the existence of God. It's very similar to Pascal's. Pascal called it a hole that exists in man, and C.S. Lewis called it a God-shaped hole that only God can fill. There are other anthropological proofs of God's existence. Many of these come from nature. Basically, they all say Earth has been tailor-made for man. All kinds of life. Life exists only on Earth as far as we know today. In the next slide, we'll look at what scientists say about the necessities of life. And it seems that the Earth in our environment is especially tailored for life. Could all of this have happened just by chance? Here is a handful of universal constants, and all of these are too complex for me to explain. Most are too complex for me to even understand, but here's the point. If any one of these constants were changed by just a fraction, life on Earth would be impossible. Let this sink in for a moment. The balance of life on Earth is very precarious. So let's look deeper at some of the universal constants. We know on Earth, oxygen makes up 21% of our air. If it were more, there would be explosions and fire everywhere. If it were just 15% instead of 21, we would all suffocate. Our oxygen level is what allows us to see the sun and also for plant and animal growth. If oxygen were more than it is, we would receive way too much solar radiation and all plants and animals would suffer. Look at the Earth's position in the Milky Way. In the Milky Way galaxy, our planet is on the very edge in a spot that's remarkably clear of the fog of space. It's in an area scientists refer to as the Goldilocks area, which is just right for life. As a result of that and the transparency that we have because of the ratio of oxygen to the other gases in our air, we are able to look up into space at night and see stars. Most of the other planets and moons in our galaxy are not as fortunate. God placed us here for a purpose to look into the night sky and wonder about our marvelous planet. Look at air. We know that air is only 21% oxygen. Most of our air comes from nitrogen, which is 78%, and argon is 1%. CO2 in our air is less than 1%. Now, CO2 has about the same number of molecules in air as it does in water. You emit CO2 every time you exhale, and when you die, and as you decay, you will emit CO2 as well. CO2 is very permeable, and it's taken in by living things very easily. Look at the moon. The moon stays within the Earth's parameter because it cannot escape the Earth's gravitational pull. At the same time, though, the moon is exerting gravitational force on the elements of the Earth, primarily the liquids on the surface of the Earth. And if it were not for the moon, the levels of water at any point anywhere on the Earth mostly would be stable and unmoving, and they would become stagnant. Yet, as the moon spins around the Earth, it pulls waters, creating tides, which help keep the waters agitated, and it keeps it from getting stale. The tides are necessary for life, and without the moon, we would have no tides. Think about gravity. If the gravitational force were adjusted by just a minuscule decillion, which is a fraction smaller than a billion trillion trillions, or 33 zeros in this number, our sun would not exist, and neither would we. Gravity, while one of the weakest of the four forces of nature, is one that has more effect on 
cosmological things than the others simply because it works on large things at great distances. And look at centrifugal force. If the spinning of the earth stopped, we would not have centrifugal force and we would fly off the planet into space. In fact, the centrifugal force created by the orbit of the earth around the sun and the spinning effect of the earth as it rotates exactly balances the amount of force that is exhibited upon us by our sun, the earth and the moon. If this balance were one day interrupted, either gravity fluctuates or the earth stops or slows down its spinning, we would have a hard time staying put and we would not be firmly fixed to the earth's surface. The speed of light is used in almost all equations. Currently, it is a constant speed of 299 million meters per second. It's traveling at that speed and it takes light from the sun eight minutes to reach the earth. If the speed of light were changed by the tiniest little bit, everything on earth would be affected and life would be impossible. Water changes from solid to liquid vapor easily by adding heat. If humidity on the earth increased, runaway gas greenhouse effects would cause temps to rise to dangerous levels. If it were to decrease, it would become too cold for human existence. So let's talk about the thickness of the Earth's crust. Earth is a sphere approximately 8,000 miles in diameter, and inside of that, our planet is a hot ball of molten material. Temperatures at the center of the Earth are about 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The Earth's crust, which surrounds the molten insides, is really very thin, only 3 to 45 miles in thickness. If it were any thinner, there would be massive earthquakes because of the instability of the crust. If it were any thicker, there would be considerably more volcanic eruptions, which would release more CO2 in the atmosphere and make life on Earth impossible. Consider the planets in our solar system. We know that Jupiter is by far the largest planet. It is 300 times the mass of the Earth, and it's also about 1,300 times the volume of the Earth. It has 120 times the surface area of the Earth, and a day on Earth is three days on Jupiter. It is very fast. Jupiter is the galaxy's vacuum cleaner. As stray cosmological debris, uh, such as comets, meteoroids, asteroids, and so forth, enter our solar system, the big giant's gravity pulls them toward it, and it clears the path for all the other planets. And the result, of course, is fewer strikes on Earth. Notice that it's placed in the center. This allows it to clear the path for all of the other planets. Is there a designer in the universe? Well, scientists say we can't say but there are many coincidences that are just too hard to explain. The Bible says, of course, God is the designer, and the average man would agree there has to be a God of the universe. So if the universe appears to be tailor-made for life, then the simplest solution may be that it was designed and that God does exist. Thank you very much.